The ocean is just chock full of friendly and not at all scary things. One of those very fun things is the foot-long blood worm with an extremely strong, painful, and venomous bite. But how does this wistful worm use its toxic teeth to deliver its malicious munch? Let's just say that nature is most definitely metal as we delve into the jaws of life, death, and taxonomy. Welcome back to Life, Death, and Taxonomy. It's your 30 minutes of interesting animal information. I'm Joe. And I'm Carlos. Thank you to Cassie for the creation of our theme song. To hear more of Cassie's music, please search Cassie Michelle on YouTube or Spotify. And thank you to Johanna for the creation of this week's artwork. To check that out, you can uh, follow us on Facebook or Twitter at LD Taxonomy or visit us at our home on the web at LDTaxonomy.com. And a very special thank you to our patrons. Uh, that have subscribed to us on Patreon. Thank you so much for your support. Tristan Taylor, Jesse Raspolich, Carol Raspolich, and Paul Chomo. Uh, it's greatly appreciated. Thank you for helping us keep the lights on. And today we're talking about another beautiful sea creature that everyone will love to look at. So look at a picture of it. You'll enjoy it. But more on that later. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you haven't heard the intro yet, but I really go hard on this. Like, it's it's <laughs> it's very sarcastic. <laughs> <laughs> like, look at this friendly boy. <laughs> look how friendly he is. Such a um, nice boy. Yeah. What What are we talking about? My two favorite things, my two favorite words and th- and concepts and things, just put together in one just beautiful animal. <laughs> True. We're talking about the bloodworm. Yeah. Bloodworm. Very, very cute very very cute um whenever i hear this phrase i think of there's a movie with daniel radcliffe in it called the jungle where he he reenacts the the true story of this uh israeli hiker that got uh lost in the bolivian jungle and at one point he gets worm eggs in his in a wound in his forehead and he has to and once they hatch, he has to squeeze them out of his head. And it's one of the most disturbing things I've ever seen. And this is what I think of. <laughs> this blood worm. It, so- it sounds like I'm going to enjoy my spaghetti later tonight. Enjoy that spaghetti. Uh, if it starts <laughs> to move, uh, take another Eat look it at faster. it. Eat it, eat um. it faster. <laughs> but yes, we're talking about the blood worm, otherwise known as the saucy sarlacc. The belligerent blood boy. And the helicopter. Yeah, nice. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm glad I, th- I, I, gl- I think I know what the major fact is, but I did not confirm. You didn't? I put I, it on the it, um. I, I put oh, it, it on, on our thing? on our sheet on our. I our saw list. this fact and found it to be major. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, well, hopefully, you. I correctly identify what the major fact is. Okay. But how about you text Would you like to hear this? what science has to say? Yeah, okay. It's the kingdom you know, you love, and you live in. It's the kingdom Animalia. Mm-hmm. It's in the phylum I don't think we've ever done. I, th- I think we have. The phylum a- is Anelida. And yeah, these are, these are segmented worms. I feel like we had to have done that at some point. Segmented squirms. Now I'm going to go through every single <laughs> episode we've got. We've got the tube worm. I think that's it. It's in, while you look that up, it's in the class <laughs> Polycata. Polychata. It's a chatterbox. It's in the order Philodocidae. Giant tube worms are in the phylum Anelida. Giant tube worms are in the phylum Anelida. So yes, we have been here before. We do a lot of different worms, especially recently. I feel we did the uh, the um, the green brood sack, which is a flatworm. Then we did the 
another flatworm. The Bedford's flatworm recently. Now we're doing the bloodworm. I think we have another flatworm coming up. We just got all kinds of... We're just on a worm kick here. It's in the fi- family Glyceridae. It's in the genus Glycera. Uh, yeah. It's not Glycera. Yeah, it's definitely Glycera. It's in the species with a binomial name, a Glycera Dibranchid Dib Dibranch. Chiata, Debranchiata? Debranchiata. My favorite Starbucks beverage. I'll have a half calf Debranchiata. Yep. <laughs> spicy. That would be spicy. But the <laughs> but with the glycera, there's like some glycerin in there, so it actually tastes kind of sweet. It's nitroglycerin though, so you don't want it. So yeah, then that's uh, bad. <laughs> don't move. <laughs> don't even breathe. You just drank nitroglycerin. <laughs> Just pray. <laughs> and I saw a post that was saying they should remake that movie instead of like all these other Disney movies that have great, well loved. Uh, they did remake that movie. It's called originals. Avatar, James Cameron's Avatar. Um, it's since we're in the business of naming things, it's time for my favorite part of the show: critter groups. And even though we've been doing a bunch of worms re- recently. They've got quite a few little collective nouns, so there's there's still there's still some more mileage we can get out of this one. Um, so this is the part of the show where I ask you, Joe, a question. That question is the same every time. What is the name of a group of this animal? What what is the term of entry? Or what is the collective noun? It's all the same. If you saw a group of worms, which is interesting because we're actually talking about segmented like the worm worms here, and not just like you know flatworms which are very different um so the uh so if you saw a group of worms you say a that's a bunch of worms b (laughs) that's a wriggle of worms c that's a slink of worms or d that's a mass of worms they are all at church (laughs) catholic worms (laughs) i'm gonna go with a wriggle final answer Ding, ding, ding. Cosmo Sheldrake, you did me right once again. What? He, uh, he has a song called Wriggle, so, and he's very into like animal things, so I feel like he was in the know on that one. Goodness, I didn't realize that being a fan of this like indie artist would give you such an edge. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he, he, he's got his finger on the pulse. Of cow bones yeah. <laughs> and worms, apparently. <laughs> Um. All right, yeah, it's a wriggle of worms. So I think we've gotten them all now. A clue, a knot, and a wriggle. That's how the, the, those are all ways you can describe uh, just a, a, a heap of worms. Well, speaking of describing, would you like to have a description of this blood worm? Something, something tells me I don't. But I'm going to well, go ahead and let you do it anyway. But watch yourself, McCoy. Well, bloodworms are segmented worms with semi-translucent skin, a toothy proboscis, and writhing parapodia. Mm, my favorite. Parapodia are just like like um, extremities, danglies, dang- danglies off the body. Well, if they're not writhing, then what kind of parapodia do you think you have? Just a parapodia, I guess. Uh, well, I got a parapodia. <laughs> <laughs> no, wait, no, I can just find one. Never mind. A parapods. Uh, they are so named because of their red color. Uh, I don't think they have. A, it's not. You don't have to worry. It's not like. Um, well, what's that lizard that squirts blood out of his eyes? The uh, horny Spiny toad. toad or yeah. Horny toad. Yeah. It's not like that. There's no blood uh, feature of these animals. That is not true. Beyond. Okay. We'll find out. I hope. Well, no, that's okay. not even, that's not even the, um, they, the fluid that they have in them contains hemoglobin. And so it is red. Oh yeah. I was going to say, 
I was going to say there's no... The end of that sentence was beyond what is normal for animals to have. Oh, okay. Blood Sorry. <laughs> in their veins. Okay. I was, in, like, in their, I was like, oh, they just, uh, there's a blood worm, but, you know, they don't have blood. Like, well, they do. And this one actually <laughs> is red because it has the same kind of stuff in blood that, that we do, but. Gross. Yeah, it is gross. Yeah, so I'm not liking a close this. Up, a close up of them is a reminiscent of Peter Jackson's King Kong. That's that is also what I was thinking about the 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 crazy like worms that attack them at the bottom of that pit. Mm-hmm. Poor poor Andy Circus finally got a role where he wasn't a, a monkey. <laughs> <laughs> he gets taken out, and then he's a monkey. I for love the rest his of monkey the movie. roles, though. <laughs> he's got good monkey roles. He had two roles in that movie: one where he's a monkey, and one where he's just a dude. And that dude was taken out almost instantly, and then he's a monkey for the rest of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> he's been a monkey. In two different franchises. Actually, well, uh, we're the tax, we're the taxonomy guys. We're, we've even covered the gorilla, and we're we calling know him it's a not monkey. monkey. It's it, colloquial. It's monkey. If it has you know, that kind of monkey, has if it has a tail, it's a it's a monkey. If it doesn't, it's an ape. That's how you we learn that on Veggie Tales. Yes, and that's how you can you can just take everything in the world and dichotomize it by those two things. Right. So my computer is an ape. Mm-hmm. And a kite um, is a monkey. Speaking of all that, and and not speaking of that at all, um, <laughs> let's talk Measure Up. Let's talk their relative size. Welcome to the Beloved Measure Up segment, the official listener's favorite part of the show. The part of the show when we present the animal size and dimensions in rel- relatable terms through a quiz that's fun for the whole family. It's also the part of the show that's introduced by you. When you when you send in audio of yourself saying singing or uh, writhing, slapping your para parabens para, paracletes, <laughs> uh, paraboscuses, yeah. the words measure up into ldtaxonomy at gmail dot com. We don't have a new measure up intro this week, but we are going back in the archives to revisit some greatest hits. Noise. Does that sound good to you? Sure, I guess. This email comes from Matt, who says, Hi, LDTaxonomy.com. I'm a web developer. Hi, Matt. (laughs) I'm a web developer. Can I redo your website for money? (laughs) That's an interesting thing to say, Matt. Thanks for listening. Never heard that one before. Hmm. Hmm. Without further ado, the listener's favorite part of the show. It's time to see how many <laughs> things go into other things measure up. Do you remember who did that one? That's not from Matt. That no, was it my, is not from Matt. That was my wedding gift to you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's in the greatest hits. That's why I didn't bring one when I when I showed up to the wedding. <laughs> that's all I needed. Yeah, just a, a little piece of paper in a in a box that said I sent in a measure up. I thought it was gonna be a measure up of Matt, but it would've been funny if he was like, "Hi, my name is Matt. I'm a web developer. Would you mind if I redesigned your site for free <laughs> or for for money?" <laughs> No, no, that was that. There was an actual email for, from someone named Matt, but it was just a uh, an ad. sales call, an ad. Um, so yeah, thank you to you for sending in a measure up, uh, a matrimonial themed measure up. Yeah, I should have done that. Wait to, to, to do that one uh, on the second anniversary of that situation. Yeah, that's way down the road though. So several months away. Okay, let's get into length. They're 14 inches or 35 centimeters. So how many blood worms go into the distance from the sun to the farthest orbiting object in the solar system? The Oort cloud? No. Uh, Here's a hint. Far, far out or 2018 AG 37 is a trans-Neptunian object that was discovered to be the farthest object orbiting the sun. It beat out far out 
which is another object discovered in the same year. It orbits so slowly that observation for two years has not made it possible to accurately map its orbit. What does trans-Neptunian mean? It comes, it goes out past Neptune. Like Pluto? Yeah. So is Pluto trans-Neptunian? No, no, no. I think it comes in, its orbit brings it in. It's like one of those elliptical orbits. Like Pluto? Does it? They're all elliptical. Every single one of them is elliptical. No, I mean, it's like super, more elliptical than the others. Like it's a oblong compared to other orbits. Meaning it comes in close to the sun and then is flung back out. Oh, that's got to be a fun slingshot maneuver. Yeah. For far out or whatever you whatever it was called. Yeah. So the, far, it's far for, its furthest point? For, it's where it was discovered. We don't know its furthest point because we don't know its full orbit. But it's still the farthest thing away. Can't find Planet Nine, but we can find tiny little things that are super far away. I feel like trans-Neptunian just means that it goes across Neptune. It must cross Neptune's orbit to the point where, like, if every if the stars aligned, they would run into each other. Or this thing would crash into Neptune. There's a lot of space in space. That's true. That's probably why they called it that. <laughs> um, I don't know. <laughs> the distance between this and the sun... Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. I have such a bad like conversational memory too. If I had a better conversational memory, I would remember how far away some of the stuff we've talked about is from the sun. But every single time we come to this, I have to like, I'm just like, I don't know. Septillion something. (laughs) Um... Let's see. If the Earth is 92 million miles, I do know that, 92 million miles away, it's the third planet from the sun. Assuming that every single planet is the exact same distance away from the sun as the last planet, (laughs) or the the, uh, the exact same increment, uh, which, if my placemat is correct, then (laughs) must be right. Um, And I do stare at that every morning when I eat my Cheerios. Part of that sentence is true. I do eat Cheerios pretty much every morning. Cheerios are the best. Actually, they're better at night. Cereals, cereal just tastes better at night. Um, I think trillion is a good one. That might be too much. No, trillion is good. That that sounds nice. And you know what? We'll go with one. (laughs) We're going to go with one trillion. Um... Maybe I should go with 14 trillion. It's patriotic, right? It's the national debt. <laughs> Getting close to 4th of July here. 14 trillion it is. Actually, it might be more than that now. I haven't I haven't really thought about the na- national debt in a little while. Um, I don't know why I'm typing this into a calculator. <laughs> That's not going to help. Um, so then... And it's miles... Or Alice. Or Miles, who is Bible Man. You might as well not even do math. Just yeah, there's no guess the to do number math. of worms. Um, because, yeah, if it's going to be tr- 14 trillion miles, then we're going to have to go by like several thousands. So it's definitely I mean, going to be like. A whole fi- four, 50, 14 inches of worm. Quadrillions here. I'm going to go with 60 quadrillion worms that's it done 60 quadrillion worms yes final answer not correct (laughs) (laughs) darn it no we're close it's probably pretty we're talking 56 trillion worms ah the object is 132.2 give or take 1.5 au which is 19 AU, by the way, is astronomical unit. It is the distance between the Earth and the center of the sun. Um, 19 billion? That's 19 billion kilometers, give or take 22 
point twenty two billion. Yeah, I can never remember what the scale of the, <laughs> the solar system is. So I just I like to just add three zeros to things when I'm not sure. <laughs> it's really helped in my financial life. <laughs> a quadrillion is so big. Yeah, it is a lot, but there is a lot of space in space, as you mentioned so yeah. so astutely earlier. But there's not that much space in the solar system. There is if you include the Oort cloud. Their maximum lifespan is about five years. So how many bloodworm lifespans go into the length of the longest year of any planet in the solar system? Why are these all astronomical? Because I like space. <laughs> and whenever we are... have to go to the... Whenever we... As above, so below. Every time we go to the ocean, we have to go to space. Is that the rule? Yeah, because that's what... Isn't I that usually... a movie about, like, zombies in the crypts of Paris? <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Um, the whenever we we're not talking about a specific region, I like to talk about space. It is a movie about zombies underneath Paris. Um, huh. Um, oh darn it! Well, people are gonna come to this show and be like, "Wow, they talk a lot about space." Just they fumble a lot about space. Mm-hmm. <laughs> The longest day of any planet? Yeah, here's a hint. Speaking of Neptune, That's... it has the longest year of any planet um, in the solar system. Not including Pluto. Pluto, it, were it a planet, would have the longest year. It is a planet. They gave it back its name tag as a planet. No, they did A didn't. while ago. Yes, they did. I don't know. NASA.gov still says Pluto is a dwarf planet in the Kuiper Belt. That sounds like a planet to me. They had demoted it to planetoid. Is a dwarf star not a star? Of course it's still a star. Not, that's discrimination. <laughs> Leave in the comments below if you think Pluto is a planet. I 100% think Pluto is a but planet. But the problem with that is that they discovered all of these similar sized things in the Kuiper Belt. Or, yeah, in the Kuiper Belt. So if you, if you say that Pluto is a planet... Then we have th hundreds of thousands of planets in this planets in the solar system. Well, Pluto is round, um, and it it has its own orbit around the sun. So it's not like part of a larger belt of things. It is. There may be things in the solar system that are bigger than Pluto, but it's not size. It's relationship to the sun that makes it a planet. I think. What's it's the relationship? Yeah, like, you know, are things going strong? Are they on the fritz? Mm -hmm. Hot and heavy? Who knows? It's definitely not hot and heavy for Pluto, I got to tell you that. I did see that episode, the very first episode of uh, Magic School Bus. Things are not hot and heavy on, on Pluto. <laughs> Arnold is dead. <laughs> he, he died on that planet. Um, all right. All right, so I think that this... this, this um, Neptune's year. I'm going to say it's 15 years. <laughs> this article. For 76 years, Pluto was the beloved ninth planet. No one cared that it was the runt of the solar system with a, a moon half its size. No, no one minded that it ha had a tilted oval-shaped orbit. Pluto was a weirdo, but it was our weirdo. Quote, children identified with its smallness. <laughs> road, road, road science writer Dave uh, Sobel adults uh, related to its existence as a misfit I don't care no. how people relate to it all of that is all of that is probably mostly false I can't speak for everyone but uh, you don't have to relate to a planet <laughs> in order to think that it's a planet <laughs> how do people relate to Jupiter what's your th logic behind that I, I said so. The answer is three because I think it's fifteen years for the um, for Neptune to go around the, the sun once, and there's five years in a worm's lifetime. So the answer is three. Final answer. Yep. That's big wrong. Oh. Thirty-three worm lifetimes. That is whoa. Neptune's year is one hundred and sixty-four years and two hundred and ninety-two days. That is slow. It's slow. 
it's slow it's and far, it's like really it's far slow. away. Yeah. Goodness, somebody needs to give Neptune a push. AP US history? I don't think it'll pass. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I had dual enrollment US history, so try writing that on all of your papers. <laughs> um, let's get into some fast facts before we get into the major fact. One day you'll get us a uh, an, uh, nursing school level victory in an astronomical question. Well, with the astronomical questions, I'm at this point just happy if I get the same like number of digits in the number. It's like, oh, the answer was trillions, and I said trillions. <laughs> Hooray! <laughs> but but then wouldn't you be pretty close to the percentage anyway? I guess even a single trillion is very large and a way off. I mean, I would still be good on the percentage side, but yeah, yeah it'd be way off. So let's talk fast facts. Bloodworms live in tidal flats where they bury themselves in the ocean floor to prepare for an ambush. They'll ambush pre prey. Um, and they're, they'll pretty much eat anything that can fit down their nasty little gullets. Same. Bloodworms are venomous. Did you know that? I did know that. <laughs> um, they kill their prey by injecting them with venom uh, that's stored in their glands. Uh, as venom usually is stored in venom glands. While they aren't deadly to humans, their bite is extremely painful. Like, kind of like a bee sting. Extremely, I don't know. Some pe bee stings are like the, uh, the like, gold standard for, like, ouch, this animal hurt me. This small animal hurt me. And there's way there's things that are, like, many times a bee st sting in terms of pain. But they're painful. Yeah, yellow jackets so, are a lot worse than bees. Bullet ants. Stuff that, you know, Coyote Peterson enjoys. Bullet ants also feature enjoy. in that movie, that uh, the the Jungle movie with, I can't remember his name now, Daniel Radcliffe. The Jungle Book 2. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Electric Baloogaloo. <laughs> I'm so funny. That was, that was, <laughs> mm, chef kiss. <laughs> Uh, they may, <laughs> let's talk about some fast facts continued. Uh, they may be eaten by bottom feeders, fish wise, um, other worms and crustaceans, but they, since they live in tidal waters, um, they may be eaten by gulls, especially during low tide. Warm waters, the warm waters, the warm waters of midsummer trigger blood worms to transform into Epitoke or epitoki, epitoke, tokemon. Sure, um, like toke, which is like a hat. Yeah, T toke t o k e. Uh, oh, never e p i t o k e. Um, not pope. Did toke. you say pope like a hat? <laughs> no, toke, <laughs> like a like the uh, like chef's hat. Oh, I, but I think that's um, like t o u. C-H-E or something like that. Touche. <laughs> Epitoke um, is a non-feeding worm stage. It's a stage to make more worms and nothing else. Um, then they'll swim up to the surface with other worms and release their gametes, which are fertilized cells. Fertilization cells, not fertilized cells. You disgust um, me. Go on. I said, okay. go on. <laughs> okay. Uh, they then will die. That's how they die. They release their gametes, and then that's it. That's game over, man. Um, so many questions. They hatch. When, when, they, when they hatch, they are zo zooplankton, which is plankton. That's animals, as opposed to phytoplankton, which is plankton. That's plants. plants. Uh, <laughs> then they cover themselves in a silk sock made of silt. Say that five times fast. Isn't that gross? Silk sock uh, made of silt. Yeah. In this silk sock made of silt, they will develop into the nasty red worms we know and love. I do love them. They are commonly used as bait fish. I mean, fish bait. <laughs> They're not fish. Same, same, same thing, different thing. Actually, quick tangent. I, I, I meant to say this at the beginning, but I forgot. 
We have a new member in the fish family. Do you hear about this? State of California has legally declared that bees are fish. For the purpose of protecting them? Yes. So, like, you know, they, they have they have an act that covers uh, mammals and fish and uh, reptiles and amphibians. But it doesn't cover insects. What are they supposed to do? Should they amend the act to include insects? Or should they legally classify bees as fish? So it they, seems they like a very Californian thing to do, to, to saying the ends justify the means. Like that's very Californian. It seems. What do you to. really think about it? We're all fish, bro. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, since uh, the, though though they are fish bait, um, while they can get you bites, they can give you bites as well. So be careful when you cast when you're when you're baiting your lines. And that's all I got for that. Do you have any major facts before we get into the end? <laughs> I do. So this major fact is called the Jaws of Life. Death well, like and taxonomy. Strife. Yeah, Jaws of Strife. So if is if as if and oh, I don't know if you mentioned this, but bloodworms are like onions. Yeah, they have layers. They stink. Like a parfait. Um they're they're super aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> they're um they're that's why i call them uh the belligerent blood boy um which is exactly what my bloodborne character was named um very belligerent just going around smacking all those all those wolf wolfmen but yeah they they will fiercely defend their territory against other bloodworms um they will also fight off potential predators you if you try to pick them up um, and then also they're they're pre they are predators, and so they just kind of attack anything that gets too close to them, and then they just they kind of take it from there. Am I gonna eat this or am I gonna leave? Um, so as if that weren't bad enough, uh, they also hold a special place among all the squiggly dudes known as worms, as one of the only two venomous worms in the world. The other one is the leech, and it doesn't use its venom to um, hurt its. Well, I mean, it does hurt its prey, um, but it doesn't use its venom to like uh, as a hunting measure. It uses it to prevent the host's blood from clotting, which is oh man, clot. That's a that that that's another one that takes its place among the, my least favorite words of all time, um, because it's only used for <laughs> for blood. Um, but yeah, so really the bloodworm is the only worm that uses its toxin to kill its prey or to hunt its prey. Um, but how does it deliver its creepy crunch? It's nefarious nibble. Well, as we mentioned, the bloodworm's mouth has four black teeth. I don't know. Did we mention this? I have this written down as we mentioned, assuming that you talked about it. Um, we don't share notes. <laughs> Well, I assumed you the teeth was something important. Yes. So the blood, if you've ever seen Peter Jackson's King Kong, those giant worms that come out of the ground and attack them. Th this is, yeah, this is basically what we're talking about. Um, it's at the end of its proboscis, its mouth. Um, it has four black teeth-like jaws. So these, these hooks, these talons. Um, that come out and it makes it look like a baby like sarlacc pit just with far fewer teeth a they... dune situation yeah new dune not old dune old dune was like the the sandworms were just these like giant they were kind of like demogorgons they had their like their mouths split open like flowers <clears throat> but in the new dune they they have just like a bunch of teeth on the inside so yeah this is um all the these are these black kind of like they look like bird talons that are um that are facing inward uh and they're not teeth because teeth are made from organic material they're they're bones um they're these are jaws so they are quote not made within the confines of living tissue according to university of california researcher herbert 
weight or white and he's kind of the foremost th this the uh the the bloodworm popped up on everyone's radar because of this guy's research very recently like this year he figured out how these jaws are made um how the bloodworm even even makes them um by like simulating elements and i'll talk about it later um but the what he says is these jaws are actually made at the interface between living tissue and seawater so this is due to a pretty complicated process chemical process um that i will try to explain but like every anytime we get dip into specifically chemistry things get like a little, a little way over my head because that was the one science that i did not care for very much in school I chemistry like... and electricity yeah so the, the the electrical aspect of physics i did not really understand i liked it but i never understood it um and chemistry i liked biology i liked the other elements of physics um and then uh astronomy but Anyway, so this is a this is a chemical process. The jaws, so the the when a bloodworm is forming these jaws, and they're only formed once, um, when they're going th when it's it's becoming it's a, Yofo. going, you're only formed once. <laughs> hey, that's very true. <laughs> I mean, so is Yo I guess Yolo is also also true. If you don't count, you know, eternity, but um. The, so yeah, they're only made once, and when it when the bloodworm matures into its adult stage, um, it has the it has these proteins near its mouth, <clears throat> and it also has a large concentration of copper, like the metal copper. So I, I thought you meant the dog helicopter. Yeah, it's it's just it's just full of the most adorable basset hound you've ever seen. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I don't know if that's even, I don't know if that's more impressive or, <laughs> or just the same impressive as actual metal copper. Yeah. And, and it's prey is always full of Todd, <laughs> Todd and copper. Um, cause they're the best of friends. This bloodworm is no one's friend though. I gotta say that. So it's very dissimilar to the copper we, we do know and love. Um, but yeah, so there is a lot of uh, copper in this, in, in, especially near the mouth of this, uh, of the bloodworm. Um, and the uh, when the protein binds with the copper in its body, uh, it creates a hydrophobic compound. And hydrophobic means that it repels water and water repels it, like oil and water. They do not mix. Um, so like your, uh, like a windbreaker, or like a your North face jacket, it's water does not seep into it. It's hydrophobic. Um, and so what this does is it makes it, it pushes the, and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure this is how I understood it. I read it in five different articles, including the original one. And, um, I think this is the, what, um, uh, the, what Herbert Waite was talking about. Um, but it, uh, so like it, it creates this melanin. So the, the, the compound of protein and copper get together and they create like a form of melanin, which is in everybody's skin in varying degrees. Um, and it's also in your hair. So in humans, it tends to blob together, like form these blobs, uh, microscopic blobs that, that, uh, make up, you know, whether your skin is lighter or darker. Um, but this, the hydrophobic aspect of this compound pushes the melanin together with this compound. So now we have the protein and the copper together, and then now it's producing the melanin and getting mixed with the melanin. And the three musketeers get together and they form rigid structures. Uh, and it ends up like these jaws like the, the the there was nothing that told me the exact mechanism of how, why they why they're all sharp why they all look like raptors talons or something like that it just says they come together 
and we form rigid, like almost crystalline structures, and they end up being these sharp talons, and only four of them. Um, they're hollow on the inside, like snake fangs, and they are covered in copper. So they are metal jaws. <laughs> That's why I call them the jaws of life because you know, they're metal. Um, and so these like murder tubes just make themselves and then galvanize and li they literally galvanize and uh and and then now you know blood boys got like these really really strong almost indestructible like uh latching mechanism so once it's latched onto its prey it uses the thing at, that it has latched with um to inject the the paralyzing venom um through the through the the fang part of it um, and that includes its rivals, that includes the fish and, and crustaceans, um, and into you, if you decide that you want to get bit by one of these guys. If that's just your fancy, I'm not here to yoke your yak. Um, but if you don't want to get bit, stay away. This is like a foot long blood worm. I don't think I need to tell you to stay away. Um, but yeah. Equipped with metal jaws that are full of venom. <laughs> so we'll see I, if they're... I'm, I'm actually pretty interested to see uh, where this goes as they do more studies, like to see like how, how actually these, these things are formed. Um, apparently, bloodworms are tough to grow in labs. Uh, so they can't, it's, it's tough for them to observe like exactly this process. The way that they did this was by isolating the, the protein, the, and then the copper and the melanin, and then recreating the process with a, with a, um, with a, a an imitation protein that they, that they created. So they actually haven't seen this happening. They just... This is the this is the process in a controlled experiment they did. Um, so there's still a lot of work to do in the blood worm research community. <laughs> um, Teeth and, like a sunburnt penny. <laughs> do pennies get sunburned? No, if they were made of melanin. They would. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Um, so that was the blood worm. <laughs> For you out there in Podcastia, always be ready for a fight. Latch onto your dreams and don't let go. And use your hydrophobic proteins to your advantage, like the blood worm here in Life, Death, and Taxonomy. Hey Taxonomy Titans, I just want to remind you that we now have a Patreon. Patrons can see full video episodes and get shoutouts on the show. But ultimately, it's a way for you to help us cover some costs and get even better. Still, reviews are the best way to help us grow. So if you haven't left one yet, we'd really love to hear from you. As always, thanks for listening and engaging. podcast <laughs> let's go fly a kite the kites have tails so the monkeys um so for you <laughs> so for you <laughs>